And we ended last time, we talked about this synthetic transformation and how we would kind of plan it out to end up adding this bromine onto this structure, but in a different way than simply adding it to the double bond. And then I also gave you this other one to look at. Here, the second part. Did um, everybody get a chance to look at that and try it? Or do we need some time now? Okay, so let's, let's take a look together. I'm just gonna try to draw a line down here and do it. All right, first thing to do when you're dealing with these synthesis problems is always look at the carbon skeleton. All the other examples we did yesterday, there's no change to the carbon skeleton, meaning the carbon stay however many there are and in the same order that they are. This, now we see something a little bit different. What, what has changed here with respect to the carbon skeleton? Yeah, we've actually lost a carbon. So this, this CH3 group, uh, on the end here coming off of the double bond is not there in the, in the product. So what does that tell you about what needs to happen in this transformation? You have to cleave. Yeah, there has to be some sort of a cleavage process that will actually get rid of some carbon. And that really kind of narrows things down because we haven't looked at a whole lot of those, right? We haven't talked about very many reactions that actually cleave a carbon part off of a structure. What's one that we have talked about? Or I guess we, meaning you and your other class. Yeah, uh, so those would be two, two of them. Ozonolysis, and then uh, osmium tetroxide is actually a diol uh, synthesis, but then you can cleave that with uh, periodate. That's ozonolysis, that's ozone. Um, osmium tetroxide is OSO4. Which is, which is actually a, another way to do it. Okay, so if we, um, here's, the, here's a little bit of the danger. So you say, okay, we're gonna cleave this with ozonolysis, great. If you work from the beginning toward the end, you say, all right, ozonolysis with a reductive workup, um, which I believe this book what did you guys use for reductive workups last semester? It was in addition reductions. Well, anyway, we'll look it up in a second. Um, let's keep talking about this. So you do this, and does that get you the product? No. No, why not? Right, you haven't put the double bond in the correct position. This would lead to this type of cleavage product. Yeah? and that's not the correct product. So that must not be right. You're going to save a little time if you start from the end and you say, what cleavage starting material underwent ozonolysis and became this? And in that case, you might say, Something like this. Right, we don't really know what's coming off of that because it was cleaved off, but something in that kind of a um, mode. Now this is certainly a different molecule from this, but we can say, well, this, this is probably the closest. Because if there were other stuff attached, that means we have to add something and then cleave it off later. This one actually has the same number of carbons as this, so it has the same carbon skeleton. All right. So now we have a problem much like the ones that we looked at last time, which is the shift of an alkene functional group from one position to another. Um, do you remember how we did that? How did we shift an alkene functional group from one spot to another last time? What? Well, it wasn't exactly a rearrangement, but it was a sequence of steps. Uh, what, was, what were the two steps that we used? Remember? Yeah, elimination reaction. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so you put some kind of thing on there, like you, you do an addition reaction that adds some sort of leaving group, and then you do an elimination in the way that gets you the new alkene. All right. So now the new, here's your O's analysis, and then the new reaction is going to say, all right, well, we want to start with some kind of a leaving group here, all right, maybe a bromine or something. And then we can eliminate it. with uh, that sequence of steps. It's not just O3, though, isn't it? Like O3 plus like, H2. Yeah, that's what I was going to look up, because there's a couple different. If you um, put it in with a letter, like one, one step is O3, and then the second step H2. Well, I, right. That's, so let's, let's do this quick review while we're talking about that. There are two ways to cleave VO's analysis. One way is an oxidative workup, usually in the presence of something like peroxide or water, things with oxygen. What that means is the um, intermediate, which is an ozonolide, which is a, a ring, I don't know if you remember, it's a five-membered ring with three oxygens in it. That is then broken down by some more oxygen, and that actually ends up oxidizing further to the carboxylic acid. Always. What? Always. In, these, in this case, yes. The other way to do this is ozonolysis with a reductive or zinc. So they use, your book just calls it DMS for dimethyl sulfide. It's actually a sulfur with a methyl group on either side. And that's a mild reducing agent. And it also says or zinc in the presence of water. Sometimes it's listed as zinc in the presence of acetic acid. Those are reductive conditions. They're actually, uh, they reduce the intermediate ozonide rather than oxidize it. And then you end up with the aldehyde product. Which is what we want above. Okay, so if it's in water with the peroxide product after the analysis, mm -hmm. you'll get the carboxylic. Right. And then DMS will take you to a ketone. An aldehyde. If it's a secondary carbon, like so if it can't be an aldehyde or, or a carboxylic mm -hmm. acid, then it doesn't matter. And in fact, now that I'm looking at it, the book doesn't address the oxidative cleavage at all. So this book only talks about this. And in general, that's OK. So let, let me put like a little box around this. This is far more important because there are easier ways to cleave that leads to carboxylic acids, uh, like potassium permanganate, for instance. So if you're going to do ozonolysis, this is usually what's done. And that's the, that's the one to remember. Um, that is because that one's a bit unique. And the only way you can really get those aldehydes. Okay. So today, we're going to continue talking about synthesis, and we're going to focus on reactions that do actually change the carbon skeleton. And we're going to talk about how you figure those out, what you do with them, and so on. So let me give you a problem. Like this. Start a little easy. All right, similar synthesis problem. What's the change in the carbon skeleton here?
Yeah, we're adding on an ethyl group, or more specifically, an ethyl group, right? a triple bond uh, ethyl group. Or an acetylide. So we've extended the carbon chain by two carbons that happen to also have a triple bond between them. Um, so what kind of reaction can we use to, to do that? Does anything come to mind? Elongation. The what? It's an elongation process. True. We've got to use Na, NH, or yeah, Na, NH2. Well, let's think about this for a minute. So this goes back to the alkyne chapter, which was chapter, what, 9 or 10? 10. And in that chapter, we talked about how the end of an alkyne can be deprotonated by a sodium amide base. So you can take acetylene or similar alkyne. You can deprotonate it with an appropriate base, like sodium amide. And you can make the sodium acetylide ion. Uh, sort of. I'm kind of just digressing a little bit. I'll show you how to, how to actually use this in the context of the synthesis. And then the byproduct from that reaction is ammonia. So you made these, and then you talked about how stuff can be stuck on the outside of, or on either side of the acetylene by subsequently reacting this acetylide with a primary halide. And we said that this acetylide could act as a nucleophile and do an SN2 reaction on the alkyl halide. Do something like that. And let's note that this is, this has to be a primary halide. Why is that? Why can't we substitute on a secondary or a tertiary halide? You wouldn't get a terminal alkyne, is that right? That's true, but um, what if you didn't want a terminal alkyne? Um, it, would it proceed um, SN1? Um, if you, um, it, oh, for possibly, yeah. If, uh, if you have it like a or Yes, yes, possibly it could. Although there's a bigger problem here. That, that could also be a problem, but there's an even bigger problem. Hindered. It's sterically hindered, which means what would it do? It well, it wouldn't happen, but a competing reaction would occur instead. Anybody know what that would be? Yes, elimination reaction. So if it's sterically hindered, remember that an SN2 process requires a lot more crowding because the nucleophile has to come in to the um, center and, and do the reaction. It's a lot more crowding than an elimination reaction when the base just has to access an alpha hydrogen, or I'm sorry, a beta hydrogen um, next to it. So when you have large, strong bases, and acetylides are pretty large, strong bases, if they have to try to get into anywhere crowded, they will probably not, and they'll do the elimination instead. So if you try to do this reaction, let's put this in perspective here. Let's say we want to do this. And we want to get here. Okay. That wouldn't happen. Instead, you would get the elimination product. So instead of substituting,
he would get the E2 elimination or E1 elimination depending on the substrate. Secondary or tertiary substrate would eliminate, which is not what we want there. Okay, so that all said, kind of as an aside here, oops. let's go back up to this problem. Now, what happens if we look at this from the other side? This was a little, this was sort of how we would have looked at it last semester. We're talking about alkynes. Here's something that alkynes would do. Now we're looking at it from the other side. Here's a synthesis. We want an alkyne. So what do we do? Do we have to then get acetylene and show how it's deprotonated and then bring it in from another thing? Um, no, I, we don't have to do that in this case. What we can say in this case is that this is a one-step reaction where the reagent that we're using is sodium acetylide. Okay. So we can just do that and say this is what we're adding to the substrate to do this reaction. This is actually a one-step synthesis. It's good for you to know that this is how that all works because it could go the other way sometimes. But we can assume that we're going to just do this and add that in as a reactant. All right. So are there any um, questions about that process? In the next chapter, we're going to talk about some other ways to elongate the carbon chain that are a little bit more efficient and a little easier to use. But the utility of this is that not only do you elongate the carbon chain, but you elongate it with something that is also a functional group. The product is still an alkyne. So now you can do all the alkyne-y stuff to it that you wanted to. Um, we could, I'm going to just draw some arrows. I'm not going to put in the reagents, but here are some things that you can make from alkynes. Um, you can make ketones. You can make aldehydes. You can make double bonds. Then you can do things to the double bonds, all the double bondy stuff you like to do. Um, you can add halides, you can add hydrogen bromide, uh, you can add whatever, right? All of that same stuff is available to you. And so in syntheses, these will often be your products that you actually want because alkynes are somewhat reactive and usually not the desired end product. But the alkyne makes a good intermediate or a good route to that when you need to elongate the chain. So now we're going to look at a couple examples of some synthesis problems that use these techniques but don't actually end on an alkyne. The way that we know that we have to use that alkyne is by thinking about the chain being elongated. And that's sort of our clue that, ah, this must be uh, an alkyne type process. OK. So let's start with this one. We're going to do a few of these. Now this one I'm going to give you the hint of, of that there's an alkyne there to start with. So you've got an alkyne, and now you are extending the carbon chain, and you end up with an alkene, not an alkyne. So using this, the techniques that we've just talked about, take a look at these, work backwards, figure out where your alkyne ends up being, and then where your disconnection ends up being, or where your connection is formed. And see if you can come up with a synthetic plan for this transformation. Um, a lot of you look like you're on the right track, so that's great. All right, the, again, we're going to work backwards from the final product. We see the double bond there, and, and we know that we need to elongate the chain. So we might not be right, but my first guess is going to be that that double bond came from a triple bond. 
because we knew we know we need that alkyne in there eventually to do the ch chain elongation. And this may seem sort of trivial, like why would we do this step by step and think about this? The reason I emphasize this process is that it will be important when we get to very large molecules with, with many steps. So I would say we could say that that double bond came from the reduction of the triple bond. And maybe you don't remember the exact conditions of that, but hopefully there's something in your head that remembers, yeah, that reaction kind of happened sometimes um, on my exams when I was getting it wrong. But anybody remember those conditions? Metal reduction? That's the metal reduction, right. So you're talking about lithium or sodium metal like in liquid ammonia. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a similar set of conditions that gives you the cis alkene. Remember what those are? Um, like catalyst, like poison catalyst? Yes, yes. Hydrogen with a. Um, poisoned platinum or palladium catalyst known as Lindlar's catalyst would the other way to do it. And that will give you the cis alkene. So, okay, now going back, moving backwards. So let's find the point of attachment. Let's find where this thing would break. It could be on either side of the alkene. Which side are we going to go? The bottom side or the top side here? Why the top side? Right. Well, careful. Actually, they're, they're equivalent on both sides. Both sides of this would be equivalent, right? If you break that, that's going to be a primary alkyne. Sure. But you're right. You're also right that that's the right spot to break it. The reason that's the right spot to break it is because that puts the alkyne on the side that makes it look like the starting material. If we did it over here, then this would not look the same as this. It would have one fewer carbon. So that kind of gets us in trouble, then we have to add some other carbon another way, it becomes too complicated. So uh, this way, this looks exactly like that. And so that's going to actually be a direct step when we break that. So how do we do that? Well, we have to deprotonate that alkyne, as we did before, and then react it with the appropriate alkyl halide. So we deprotonate it first. And then what would be the appropriate halide here? How, how can you tell? Ethyl iodide. Ethyl iodide, why? Um, because you need two carbons and Yeah, so you got two carbons here, which means that whatever you put here has to have two carbons. And then whether you use an iodide or a bromide or a chloride in this case is, is uh, up to you. It would be fine either way. That would be a good route that synthesis. Okay. You ready to, ready to try a, a similar one on your own? You get a little bit trickier. Whoops, hold on. Yeah, that's right. OK, give this one a try. Uh, try it out for a minute, and then talk to the people around you, see what they're thinking, and see if you agree or disagree about them. All right, I want to point out one thing. Um, I've seen a lot of good work going around. A lot of people are doing some good chemistry, remembering some tough stuff to remember. Um, but I want to point out why sometimes things don't work the way that you should. So here's one thing that, that I saw. Um, you see this thing. You think, OK, clearly uh, we're extending the carbon chain. So we're going to talk about that alkyne substitution chemistry. So that must mean I need to make this double bond into an alkyne so that I can then substitute it on something. So you start from the beginning, and you start saying, all right, uh, well, let's see. If I brominate this, I can make <coughs> this, and then if I um, 
doubly eliminate, I can make this. So now I've got my triple bond. And now I just have to figure out a way to connect this. So I'm going to use this and this. What's the problem with that? I don't. Let's see, here's this one is going to be this one, two, and then I'm adding three. No, I got enough carbons. That's right. Um, you can't do substitution on an sp2 carbon. You remember that? You need an sp3 carbon to have the proper geometry. An sp2 carbon, the nucleophile would actually have to come in between these two parts, and the orbital would be kind of be stuck there, and there isn't enough room for the nucleophile to actually get in between those two other um, sp2 orbitals. So, so this doesn't work. This part doesn't work. Right. And in fact, so you say, okay, well maybe if I use just um, an alkane, and then what do I do then? Okay, well let's try that. So we go here and say, okay, say, same thing. What if we just do that? Well, that gives me here. But that doesn't really help either. Um, because now, if you're going to try to get that double bond over to there, that's going to be some steps that actually don't even work. Because suddenly, remember, you can only do selective elimination if one side is different from the other side. And this side, in this case, the two sides are going to be roughly the same after the reduction. So you're kind of stuck. And this is the danger of working forward, is there's all these different ways you can react these things. But if, it doesn't, if it's not going to get you to where you need to go, then you're stuck. And it's just, that's it. So if you work backwards, you always know that it's going to get you to the end. Even if you are having trouble connecting a couple spots, at least you know that it's going to get you to the next end spot, um, and you're not going to just run into a dead end and have to rethink the whole thing again. Um, all right, so let's, let's do that now, and then I'll give you a couple more minutes to try to finish it up. So instead of doing that, I'm going to work from the end. I'm going to say, okay, I know that we need to add more carbons. So I'm thinking triple bonds. And I know that I can pretty easily reduce a triple bond into a double bond. So I'm going to say that this molecule with that double bond came from this triple bond. Okay. And now I know that I can disconnect on either side here, depending on what I want, using the chemistry we talked about earlier. So think about where that gets you, moving again in the backwards direction. OK, one thing that I see almost everybody, it's like you have this big um, mental block. And I'll show you what it is. And when I reveal it, you'll, you'll be amazed that you had that. Maybe not. Maybe you won't really care. But let's talk about it anyway. So one thing when I was talking about just draw some stuff, just write some stuff down, just figure this out, it might give you a clue. So one thing I might do, if I'm, if I'm at this point, I figured out that this, I'm guessing that this maybe comes from a triple bond. But I don't really know how to proceed from there. I don't really see a good way to make this come back from this. That's fine, because that may still be many steps away. It doesn't have to look like the starting material yet. So what I'm going to do is just make some guesses. Just try to figure out some reactions that might have happened and see if anything maybe um, gives me a clue. So I look at this and I say, OK, I know about these alky alkyne reactions. I know they can connect either on one side or on the other side, depending on where is deprotonated. So let's look at both of those. First, let's look at this one. If I disconnect over on the right here, what that means is that I had 
this kind of a nucleophile and that kind of uh, substrate, right? That's what that reaction would give me if I broke there. And now let's look at the other side. If I break there, that means I have this kind of a substrate and this kind of a nucleophile. So which of those two connections most likely gets us closer to the beginning? Why the second one? Because you could, um, you could, if you, oh yeah, you could um, eliminate, use elimination, or addition, else, yeah. Addition mm -hmm. to um, add the beyond, uh, add the Markov, Markov not. Exactly. We know that. As soon as you saw that, you knew, oh yeah, I know this reaction. We can do this. So what was the major mental block? The major mental block was everybody thought that this had to become the alkyne. When in fact it doesn't become the alkyne, we put the alkyne in from another source. That's one of the reagents. This becomes the substrate that's then substituted on. And how did we solve that? How did we finally see that? Just by trying it. Just by writing down what would happen if we did these two reactions. And suddenly it was, it was clear. Yeah. I did, but I didn't think I had enough carbons. Isn't the double bond not going to be in the right spot then? So then one, two, three. And then we add that. So there's three C's. One, two, three. Is it um, this is, yeah. This is not John, right? So you got here, yeah. and then two carbons, and then the triple bond side. So here, one, two carbons, and then the triple bond. So the other two carbons, which is the other two carbons. All right, let's put this all together then and what the actual synthetic plan would look like. If we were to actually lay this out in, in steps, we would say first step. Anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr. <clears throat> Second step, we're going to add in the ion of this methyl acetylene, so the sodium methyl acetylide. And then third, we're going to do the dissolved metal reduction in liquid ammonia. Okay? And that's your three steps. I hope this helps me make my case for working backwards on these. The forwards can get you in all kinds of rabbit holes that you don't want to be in. Backwards, there's really only a few choices. And, so, and the choices are often very obvious, like this one. Which cut did we make? We made this cut, because that, that brings us right back to the beginning. Okay. All right, this book uh, does one of the best jobs of any book out there on this kind of stuff. There are lots of practice problems. There are lots of examples. It leads you through stuff. So I really recommend that. With the remaining, um, what, 15 minutes or so? We don't have that much to do upstairs, so we'll, we can go a little over if we need to. I want you to. Um, pair up with someone else, and rather than me give you a problem to work on, I want you guys to come up with a problem like this. So this time, you're going to work forwards. So you're going to start with whatever you want and build a couple of reactions onto that using anything we've ever talked about or you've ever talked about or heard about. And then you're going to put it together. We're going to put them all up here, and that'll be our uh, practice problems for the next couple days to work on. Um, and then we'll talk about them when we come back on Monday. The reason we do this is that sometimes seeing it from the other side, building the problems yourself, really helps you to see where these things come from and how I'm thinking when I design these problems. So for the next um, 10 to 15 minutes, try to design one of these. Make it at least like three to four steps or so. You can go nuts and do whatever you want. But work with somebody else and see what you can come up with.